rising above the issue of which addiction and what addiction, my question is, how did we get here in the first place? Like someone needed alcohol to answer a question. And now maybe they need running or triathlon to answer a question. So let's get to that question. Let's answer that question for that person. 47% of the folks um, in the study were at risk for one mental disorder or another. Welcome to the Training Peaks Coachcast. I'm your host, Dirk Friel. In each episode, we'll sit down with industry experts to discuss coaching methodologies, the latest research, and leading tools for endurance training. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources. My guest today is Jill Colangelo, who is a researcher at the University of Bern in Switzerland in the Department of Forensic and Sports Psychiatry. Her primary focus is on mental health in ultra-endurance athletes. She also studies overtraining syndrome, endocrine dysfunction, doping, and mental disorders in sport. Jill writes for Triathlete Magazine and even conducts consultations with athletes, teams, and coaches. I hope you enjoy this episode and can gain some insights into how you can build a lifelong, healthy relationship with your sport. Jill, thanks for joining me today on the CoachCast podcast all the way from Italy. I uh, appreciate you being on, world expert in this uh, important to topic we're going to talk about today, uh, which is uh, mental disorders within ultra-endurance athletes. So thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. You, that's a huge, that's very flattering. Thank you for calling me a world expert. <laughs> I hope yeah. to be certainly at some point. Um, it is really great to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, I mean, you can probably name just a handful of folks maybe that actually are diving into this niche area, I assume. There can't be I, that many folks out there, right? Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think um, there's reasons for that, but we, I suppose we can dive into that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how did you come to this uh, area of research? So there's got to be something in your background. You know, why focus in on an ultra endurance athletes, uh, you know, mental disorders. Yeah. So as, um, I think most of science starts, you know, how they say research is me search, right? So yeah, I am totally, uh, a person who I, I started on this journey because I was going through overtraining syndrome really badly and I was completely trashed and I really could not in my mind put together why or how a person could, um, actually put themselves into this place because this is something that we actively do, right? And I was trying to figure out, like, is this physiological? What is happening in my body? And I started to realize that it's not what's happening. It's not what my body is doing. It's what I'm doing to my body. And I realized that the question I was asking was less about, let's say, medicine or, you know, endocrinology or, you know, any of these things. And it was more about what was kind of going on in my head that allowed me to kind of put myself in that place. And so that's kind of what began this journey to figure out um, how to talk about this thing that seemed to be happening to not just me, but other people as well. And so naturally from there, the discussion of um, sort of, and remember, I always tell people the word mental disorder is what we, you know, we use in the field and it sounds really harsh, but that's just technical terms. We can say mental illness or we can say, um, you know, depression, anxiety, we can use all the words. It's fine. Right. Um, it's just that uh, that's sort of like the, the, the way we would talk about it, but we'd write about it like that in the thesis. All cetera. inclusive. Yeah, exactly. But it sounds really hard when you're like disorder. Um, but yeah, so it's it was more naturally sort of lent itself to figuring out, you know, are there predispositions of folks who kind of come into this sport? Are they using the sport to do something? What is the sort of implication for the mental involvement in this sport? And um, so then that that kind of took me down the rabbit hole into graduate school to try to figure this out. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so did, were you a runner, ultra yep. endurance yep. runner? And how many years ago was this and how did you get out of it, the yeah. overtraining syndrome? Um, so I uh, had always been, you know, an athlete in different ways, you know, high school, college, but I didn't actually get into running longer distances until um, I was just getting out of graduate school the first time. So my first master's degree, I was back in, uh, well, you know, 
late 90s um, and I was in graduate school and I was really unhealthy and I uh, you know got into bad habits and decided I would start running again and so from there kind of began the longer running the longer distance running and um, so I would say that my ultra sort of life when I went from that to triathlon into ultras and that was probably um, let's say between 2010 I sort of started and had the real sort of crash and burn like around 2015, 2016, because it, it wasn't just a couple of months that I was really, you know, burning the candle at both ends. It was a couple of years before I figured out that I needed to slow down. Um, so yeah, about 2015, 2016 is when I was going through overtraining syndrome. Um, so yeah, so at that time I was, had transitioned out of triathlon and was just doing ultramarathon. And I had actually moved from uh, the east coast of the U.S. all the way to California to quote unquote get a job, but it was actually just to you know throw myself into the trail scene out there as much as possible. And I lived in the Bay right, Area, right. Just running up and down the place, going crazy, and yeah, you know, kind of blew my brains out. Living the dream, but, yeah, as you do. <laughs> yep, actually, yes, yes. Yeah, you know, going through all this and today's topic. I mean, literally, the goal is to help people be a runner for a lifetime. It's not to say every runner needs to stop if they're running hundred mile weeks or something or something. Oh my goodness. No, my whole, um, reason for doing this and what really is my passion is, you know, first of all, you know, don't do what I did. That's number one. <laughs> and number two, um, to really dismantle the habits that we have as a culture in ultra endurance sport that seem like they are supporting um, our longevity in the sport, but they're actually cutting it short. They seem like they are supporting us and they seem like they are making us stronger and really all they're doing is breaking us down. And so what I hope to do is to um, help people find a way to not only improve, but lengthen their relationship with the sport that they love so much because you can't be sort of excited about ultra endurance, right? You're in it. You really, you're passionate about it. And so you get in it and you're so excited and you know, no, no one goes into this with the idea of maybe they'll dip their toe into ultra marathon, right? Like that's not what we do. So what I would like to do is help people keep that passion and be able to act upon it and really, really, um, expand upon it. Make sure that it's always can always can be a part of your life for a long term. And there's, I believe ways to do that. I just don't think that we're, we're not going in that direction right now as a culture, uh, as a right. ultra culture. Um, right. and I think there's things we need to do to change that. Well, hopefully it's an awakening moment, you know, so we can get into that. And how would you define ultra? Is this only for ultra endurance athletes or does this transcend into shorter events? Does Ironman qualify these days as ultra, for example? Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of difficult to accurately define what is considered ultra endurance. And so when we are looking at the scientific literature and we're trying to sort of uh, crowdsource a definition, what we can say is that an ultra endurance sport is one in which the competitions will typically take six hours or more, and they require a significant amount of volume and intensity in order to train at that level. So mm -hmm. that's a very broad definition and it doesn't seem very specific, but what it does do is leave a lot of leeway for the amount of training someone may engage in, in, in the course of a week, because I know that there are people that run ultras on very low mileage, let's say, and there's people who participate in ultra endurance sport on with very, very high mileage. And there's a lot of leeway there. So that puts in that category, anything like, um, Certainly ultra marathon, certainly Ironman triathlon, certainly ultra endurance cycling. There's plenty of that going on. Certainly ultra swimming. Believe it or not, there's people who are doing like channel swims and all this stuff. And right. there's also one really amazing ultra endurance event, which is a cross Atlantic rowing event, believe it or not. Um, hmm. And that is kind of a unique event. But those who participate in that are certainly, you know, training and they're, they can put themselves in this category. There's other folks who do things like mountaineering and schemo, and there's a lot of other events and different types of sports that would fall into this category. So we're certainly not exclusive. Yeah. yeah. Right. And when you, when you set a definition of six hours or more for the event, mm -hmm. that, that opens up a lot. I mean, 100 mile gravel races, you know, can yep. be six hours for most people. Absolutely. So, um, you know, and that, that leads us into your thesis. You, I'd love for you to explain, you know, your thesis. We'll put this in the show notes as well, a link to it. Um, 
but you categorize people by number of training hours per week. Um, so kind of, uh, you know, uh, tell us more about your thesis. Yes. So um, when I got into graduate school, uh, I was obviously slightly advanced in age, so I didn't want to waste time. I knew exactly what I wanted to study. So all the coursework I did kind of set me up so that I could be able to do this research project. And I always knew it was going to be online because I knew that I wanted to source like the community, right? I wanted to ask real athletes to talk about their kind of relationship with the sport and um, talk about their mental health there. So um, the thesis is called Prevalence and Type of Psychopathology in Ultra-Endurance Athletes. And I basically just went out to all my good friends in the ultra communities and different types and, you know, triathlon and ultra marathon and everything else I could think of and said, hey, I've got this research project I'm doing. All you have to do is enter into this link and you can be a part of it. And then just invited all kinds of different people, all kinds of different ultra athletes to, to participate. So what we did was I looked at um, some demographic questions at the beginning. I wanted to know people's age. I wanted to know, you know, um, sort of what kind of sport they were interested in. And then I asked some more specific questions about whether or not they had been diagnosed with mental illness previously, um, sort of what their experience was with that. Um, I also gave them two mental health assessments. One is called a PHQ, which is a patient health questionnaire. That is something you've more than likely encountered at any sort of general practitioner or doctor office where they're asking you sort of a broad spectrum of questions about nine different mental health uh, outcomes. So depression, anxiety, um, they even touch on things like substance abuse, a little bit of eating disorder kind of questions, some other stuff too, somatics and um, dis disorders and things. And then... Um, uh, I also, because I didn't feel that the uh, eating questionnaire was robust enough in that PHQ, I asked folks to complete something called an EAT26, which is an eating attitudes test. There's 26 questions there, and that will tell you uh, sort of risk for eating disorder and disordered eating, which, you know, are two different things. Um, okay. And then it was kind of funny. I wasn't really sure what I was going to get with the data. I was ready to just talk about the overall prevalence of mental illness in this population of ultra-endurance athletes. Um, and and we're, I was certainly able to put some some teeth to that. So 37% of the folks in my study had prior do diagnosis of mental illness versus 20% of the. How many? To 37% versus 37%. about. 37%. Okay. Yeah. And that's people who knew that they had mental illness. So they were like, oh, yeah, I've been diagnosed with XYZ. So that was coming into the study. They knew that they had been. Um, okay. They had, uh, they had that experience. And then after I gave them the assessments, so now the assessments, remember, they're, they're risk, okay? They're, they're, they're testing for risk of mental disorder. And 47% of the folks um, in the study were at risk for one mental disorder or another. So whether or not people actually knew that they were at risk, they were at risk. So it was a, quite a significant amount of people. So I was kind of excited about that. I was like, wow, this is really great. You know, I mean, it's not great, but it is good for the data, right? Because it helps us uh, right. tell a story about what's going on in this community. And um, so the, the fun part was that, you know, uh, statistics is often storytelling, right? And so when you were able to separate the data by the number of hours per week that um, the athletes were actually training, when you stratified the data by that information, then something really interesting happened, which is that not only was there, you know, overall more mental illness in this population, but it was dose dependent, which means that the more you exercised and the more you moved your body in the course of a week, the more likely you were to have uh, a mental illness or risk for mental illness, let's say. Um, huh. So that was pretty exciting. And I can give you numbers on that too. So basically yeah. uh, for the under, we stratified the data. So I keep saying we, and just because I don't want to say I all the time, but it's me. So <laughs> the data went from uh, under 10 hours per week. So anyone who was doing right. anything from one to nine hours per week. So mental illness in that population, that group was 28%. Then the second group was 10 to 20 hours per week. And then you had 39%. Then you had a group that was moving their bodies over 20 hours per week, and that was 57% of that group. Um, wow. Yeah. So, it, you know, you could see what was going on there, and that was shocking, but also not so surprising when you think about it, I guess. So, <laughs> um, that was really, it was really interesting. And I think that and then there's so many other little pieces of the data that were really compelling. For example, like the most 
um, at risk, let's say, for eating disorder without prior diagnosis, which means these are people who tested like that they had risk for eating disorder, but did not have, didn't know, right, because they had no prior diagnosis of eating disorder, were men in this wow. study, yeah. right? Yeah. And then the another interesting fact is that, you know, there was a question on this PHQ that asked a question about suicidal thoughts. And what's sort of distressing about this is there was a decent number of people that, so it was like 12% of the study population showed that they could have been at risk for suicide for self-harm, right? Or self-harm. And 37% of those people of that like cohort of 12%, like had never had any type of mental health care before at all. So those people are walking around feeling some kind of way, right? And not getting any kind of assistance or you know, we're certainly not under a doctor's care for any of that at all. And that wow. that's really distressing to me. This is more right. than just um, something that we can say is passing. This is not something that we can say is, oh, well, you know, it's fine. I'll just take it out on the road. No, you won't. That's not that's not cool. That's not that's not something that I think as a community we can allow to just gloss over and say, you know, running is great. No limits. Yay. You know, that kind of stuff. Right. Like we yeah. need to see what's happening there. Um so that's that's really what has informed a lot of the initial part of my research, or I should say the the beginning parts, yeah. And did you break it down by most prevalent disorders? Yes, I did, and um, so I would actually have to look up look up the numbers specifically, but yeah. So uh, you know, I think depression and anxiety were sort of at the top, um, and as you worked your way down, you know, there was everything else. I mean, and remember, we only looked at nine different um, nine different. Um, mental disorders. So it certainly wasn't comprehensive, but you get the idea that there's um, certainly a lot of stuff going on. And I think that the top two were, um, yeah, so the top two were depression and anxiety. Then you had somatoform uh, disorder, bulimia, binge eating, um, and uh, disordered eating. You know, there's a significant amount of substance abuse, uh, panic and anxiety attacks, like all kinds of stuff. So PTSD, you had you had a few people in there with, with PTSD. Um, you know, you had some people sort of talking about um, different mental disorders like, um, you know, either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, lots of different stuff that we couldn't actually talk too much about because they were sort of too small to represent in the study. But there were certainly right. a wide variety of, of things going on. Okay, so you've shown, in theory, higher percentage of in- ultra-endurance athletes have mental disorders versus the general population. Um, but you don't know it's the chicken or egg. You don't know if they came to the sport or how much did the sport contribute to uh, the particular disorder. Is that correct? I would say that there, you know, that was one of the things that I talked about in my thesis as being an open-ended question. And I think that more study is needed to understand that. I think there's evidence, initial is primary evidence for both, like initial evidence for, okay. for both options. I think that both options exist probably across the population and within the population. I think those both options probably exist within each person. Um, right. And so I think... Um, we have work to do, right? We have to understand, is there something about this sport that is attractive to a certain type of person? Or is there something happening in this sport, um, in these sports, I should say, that brings about this set of, let's say, symptoms or issues? Um, you know, we know that ultra endurance sports have been a great sort of resting place for a lot of restless minds. We know that. We also know that there are opioid-like neurotransmitters that are released, um, you know, during and after ultra endurance activity. So those can have an effect as well. And we do know that um, as much as the um, DSM-5 and also, uh, you know, ICD-11, which is the European version of that, um, don't recognize uh, exercise addiction as something to be <laughs> diagnosed with. Um, wow. We know, I know it's just this, again, you ask me, you say, well, what do you want to do? You know, what is your goal? That's my goal is to change that because there are a lot of people out there that uh, are suffering with something called, you know, with something that ranges from exercise addiction, exercise dependence, and um, it's going unrecognized, it's going undiagnosed. We don't have diagnostic criteria. We don't have a protocol for treatment because it's not recognized. 
and um, that that needs to change. So despite the fact that we, we say that we're, we're not ready to use that as, you know, we're not ready to diagnose that in the population, we know what's out there. We know it exists. We know that people get sick because of it, and we know that their lives change. And if you look at their behaviors and map them against um, behaviors that we would find in traditional, let's say, substance abuse, substance use, things like drugs and alcohol, we find that there's a lot of overlap <laughs> between what happens, um, you know, with regard to, you know, things like salience and withdrawal and tolerance and all those things, you know, so they, right. they start to really mimic each other after a while. And again, so, you know, is that behavioral? Is it, is it um, chemical? Those questions have not been answered yet, and they really need to be sort of looked into. Right. So you brought up exercise addiction, and it's not really recognized yet, but yet it, it's a thing and it's not a myth. So how does that manifest itself? You know, how do I know if I'm addicted or how, if I'm a coach, how might I recognize this in one of my athletes? Um, you know, what are things to look for and you know, how can we help coaches recognize this within their own athlete population? Yeah, I think that, um, so it's, you know, exercise addiction and exercise dependence are written about extensively in the scientific literature. So it is very much recognized within the scientific community, whether or not it is able to be diagnosed is, is, um, doesn't mean it's not legitimate and not real. It just means that for whatever reason, I mean, I, there's so many reasons, but that they've decided not to sort of recognize it, but it is a real thing. And it is something that unfortunately the only methods to receive care at the moment are through eating disorder clinics, because there's two types of exercise addiction, mm. one of which occurs on its own and the other type, which occurs, let's say with, um, you know, concomitant to an eating disorder. So, um, if someone is looking for treatment for an eating disorder, I'm sorry, for an, um, uh, exercise addiction, you know, you find, let's say a 40 year old guy, uh, he would have to go to like an eating disorder clinic to get any type right. of therapy that is specifically toward exercise addiction. And that's just not, I mean, that is absolutely yeah. not <laughs> acceptable. So, you know, what are the things to look for? Um, again, I would refer back to some of the things that we talk about when we talk about substance use and where usage of something, anything, a behavior, a substance, because remember, we can talk about behavioral addictions, like those are certainly recognized, things like, you know, sex and gambling, etc. Um, we can start to see what is the difference between being passionate about something and being addicted to it. And it's pretty, um, it's complex. But one of the ways we see that is when um, the need to do the thing sort of infiltrates and makes the rest of life difficult. And when a person really starts to suffer in their work relationships and this hobby, and I, you know, I'm using that term lightly because I know it's not a hobby for us, but let's call it a hobby for now, is right. really infiltrating, um, infiltrating life in a way that is just sort of, sort of cancerous. It's taking over. Um, it is changing how this person thinks. It is changing how they act. They're lying about how much they're doing. They are, um, you know, taking time off of work, away from family commitments um, to do this thing. They can't live without this thing. They um, only think about this thing. <laughs> it's really getting in the way of them living a normal life. And people around them will most likely be complaining. Family members, work people, you know, whoever's in, in their life will most likely be balking at how much time they spend doing this thing. Um, it is something that we see in our community. We sort of laugh at it sheepishly, particularly in, I would say, things like, you know, triathlon world. The triathletes are much more used to talking about, you know, triathlon widows and all this. You know, they're way more used to it. It's in their kind of vernacular. They're more comfortable oh. with it because they uh, sort of embrace um, how much time, let's say, training for an Ironman uh, takes out of someone's life. But it doesn't it doesn't. It's not funny you know, after a while right. because it's right. it's one thing if a person you know communicates with their um, significant other and says you know what this year I'm really gonna I'm gonna train for an Ironman I'm gonna be um, really busy but you know stick with me and I just want to get through this race I want to do it and and the person agrees and it's great and then you know the race is over and everything's kind of okay that's different than someone who chronically misses things like holidays, birthdays, shows up late to stuff. Um, like I said, cuts out of work early, um, you know, on a quote unquote rest day, can't, can't rest these types of things where it really starts to kind of break into, um, it starts to break into life. Yeah. I mean, and certainly, I, I mean, there's probably cases where addiction is obviously all encompassing. Therefore you can actually burn out on that addiction and you rebel, 
you then isolate from friends and family, and then you substitute that addiction for some other addiction. So if the purpose, that, that goes back to like helping people be a runner or a triathlete for life, right? If you can like hold back, do it in a healthy manner, you don't burn out on that addiction. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't become an addiction in the first place. And maybe some somewhere down the road, you, you burn out and just replace it for another addiction. And now you're isolated from friends and family. Right. So I would also say that one of the other, uh, uh, you know, symptoms obviously are signs that someone's going in a place where they shouldn't be with regard to an addiction is obviously, you know, physical decline. So when your health starts right. to take a digger and you're trying to figure out why, um, and you're either injured or sick or heading toward overtraining, your, your endocrine system is burnt out. Yes, that is another way that we know that you're doing too much. And if you can't stop, then we know that we have an issue. Um, with regard to change, like switching addictions and things. So I will tell you that, you know, I work in the Department of Forensic Psychiatry and um, um, my boss is such a cool guy. And sometimes he, you know, he's a, he's a professor in forensic psychiatry. He's absolutely brilliant. And like, if we start going down and having this conversation, he gets very nervous and doesn't want to talk about it, you know, because this is kind of an area that psychiatry is not, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of thoughts about this. There, there's literature right. that's written about exchange of addictions. There's people who disagree with it. There's, um, people who have, it, it's a very complex issue. Let me put it that way. So with, with tons of respect to Michael, I will say that, um, we can't say too much about it scientifically and be concrete. However, anecdotally, right? There's my, there's my safe word. Anecdotally, <laughs> yep. we can say that we do see that people um, may have, let's say, suffered with um, a substance addiction, and then they uh, become very excited about an ultra endurance sport and are able to spend all their time doing that and feel as though it's helping them manage the other uh, issue. And then maybe they take that too far and end up overtrained and then have to stop. And we say, um, you know, we're concerned about that person at that point for relapse, right? Either to the, to the athletic addiction or to the substance addiction. And so my point here is that rising above the issue of which addiction and what addiction, my question is, how did we get here in the first place? Like, there is a question that needed to be answered somewhere. Like someone needed alcohol to answer a question. And now maybe they need running or triathlon to answer a question. So let's get to that question. Let's answer that question for that person, you know, and then let's see what happens on the other end. And that's the work that I'm trying to do, which is to say, let's not just keep going and going and going and not examining why we are doing this. What are we trying to fix in ourselves by doing this? Because I believe right. that there's, there's that question that we're trying to get an answer to. Right. Because, you know, people think of sport as being the medicine, right? So the more the medicine, the better. Whereas you're just running farther and farther away from the underlying issue that's, that, that, that is being released or you're running away from literally w within the training. Uh, you know, I would tend to say yes, uh, because, and, and people have probably, if they've heard me talk before, they've heard me say this, it's like, we accept that there's a limit to everything in, in everything we interact with. And I've, you know, I've said that before, like you can, you can have too many pancakes, right? You can have, you know, too much of a sunny day, right? You can have too much of a good thing. Yeah, you can have too much of a good thing. And we accept this, you know, uh, you know, we're kind of joking, but like, you know, we accept this about things like medications, right? Like I always use Tylenol as an example, right? If you have a headache, you take two Tylenol, you don't take 200, right? We accept right. that for drugs. We accept that for all the things we interact with in our lives, sunlight, water, right? We can get hyponatremia, right? If we drink too much water, water is great when you're dehydrated, but too much water, you end up with hyponatremia. We all know this. So we have decided though, as a culture that we don't accept that to be true for exercise. Why did we yeah. decide that? Why did we decide that there should be, that we believe that there's just this beautiful, just curve that, I mean, this line just keeps going up and up forever, right? And we just are like, all the benefits will just increase. Well, if the benefits were to increase, the more that we exercise, then in my study, those people who were the 20 hour plus group, they would be as happy 
as clams, right? They would be, yeah. have you be like Buddha at the top there, right? Because they would be right. like, ah, I have now achieved the nirvana of running. You know, running has taken yeah. me or, 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 you know, and exercise has taken me to this place of, you know, fine and fancy mental health. Like I am up there at the top. Everything is good, right? Like I'm sitting under the Bodhi tree. Yeah, no, that's right. not what happened. You know, that's not what happened in my research. And if that were true, then ultra endurance athletes would have less, in general, would have less mental illness. Right. That's not what we've seen. Right. And this, this comes down to changing culture. So, you know, you've mentioned the bro science, you know, the, you know, the no DNF, the, uh, no pain, no gain more, better, you know, that's the, that's some of the stuff we need to break down and, and talk about. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I kind of think about ultra marathon, like we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So I think back of early days, you know, the Antracens of the world and whatever. And that's when I fell in love with ultra, it was like that kind of dirtbag culture that pulled me yeah. in, right? That whole like, you know, uh, you know, running through the trees with the maple syrup bottle in her hands. And if people listening don't know that reference, I'm sorry, but you know, as I've said before, <laughs> get your ultra history down, figure it out. Um, you know, and, and I think that um, the way things were back then, it was, you know, definitely more lo-fi. Um, you know, certainly there weren't any apps and there weren't, um, any, you know, watches and all this stuff that kind of has changed the culture quite a bit. And anyone who's been around, right. you know, since, since the early er days, because I'm still, I'm still in the history of ultras, like I'm still a baby, right? Um, people who were around in the early er days will say that, um, you know, things were, things were dramatically different and the culture was very different. And so I think that, um, we as a culture are very fascinated by superlatives, right? We're fascinated by extremes. And so the, the more extremes we see around us and the more folks out there doing those superlative things, the more we become sort of immune to them and they become normal to us. So the more we're seeing like, you know, these people doing multiple uh, ultras in multiple days or that the races are no longer 100 miles, now they're 200 miles. And, you know, now we're not training, you know, our standard is no longer training 50 miles a week. Now it's like we want to go up to 80, 100, 110. Um, and the more this becomes, quote unquote, normalized, the less in touch we are with the real physiological limits that we have. Like the conceptual limits are very different from what our bodies can actually do. And so mm -hmm. my contention is that how we were years ago, kind of like, in a lot of cases, running one, one, 100 a year, like for a lot of people, that was kind of the standard. Um, and the rest of the time sort of keeping up a base and then, you know, doing a nice periodized training across the year where we had some downtime. Um, now the race calendar is packed. There's races every week of every year. And it's not just now you have to qualify for those big races. Yes, that's right. And it's, <laughs> Um, you know, it used to be like in the winter in Massachusetts, like it was hard to find anything to run, you know, it would be like, maybe there was a fat ass people were putting together somewhere and you could kind of like, you know, grab your friends and go like brave the elements and run. But now it's like every weekend, every place, even the cold places, there's always something going on. So we have kind of shifted to this place where we just expect the superlative, right? We expect to hear about, um, these wacky challenges and we're all watching each other on Strava and all these different things. Yeah. So I think that the culture shift has been, um, a little bit of us, you know, as a society sort of getting used to and wanting more and more, you know, it's like everyone wants their running life to be like a Marvel movie now somewhat. <laughs> and then also, you know, the fact that marketing and, um, you know, running has become, or races, I should say, have become sort of a business and, you know, um, they've exploded and now there's like, you know, more e emphasis on buying tech and clothing and gear and stuff to support that. And just like anything else, it's going to explode and it's going to take on a life of its own, it, not necessarily, um, with respect to with, you know, paying as much respect as necessary to, again, what the human body can and should be doing. So right. because there's like that great big disconnect there, you know, we have a little bit of an issue. Yeah. I mean, and you've talked about, you know, overtraining syndrome, you've had that. Mm -hmm. It should be pretty obvious if you have it. I mean, you are literally sick. It's, it's not obvious, sadly. It's really not. Um, most people do not recognize the symptoms. Um, if they do, they don't sort of pay attention to them and they can really go pretty far before they absolutely bury themselves. I did, it took me like a couple of years to bury myself. 
Um, and I think that, you know, every person also has different symptoms. Let's remember too, this is something else. This is um, overtraining syndrome. It's a syndrome. So there's no biomarker that we can point to and say, it is this that improves you have overtraining syndrome. There's a bunch of different things that you can kind of pull and look at. None of, none of the testing makes any kind of sense outside of a laboratory setting because they look at like 10 million different things. And maybe we can go, well, that probably is overtraining syndrome. But like for the average person, there's really no, you can't go into a doctor. Most of the time, if you go to a doctor and say, do I have overtraining syndrome? They have, first of all, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. Second of all, they're like, well, let's test your blood. And like, nothing's going to be off really. I mean, you're not going to see pretty much anything. You might see some low thyroid function. You might see some um, you know, nutritional issues potentially, but sometimes people go in and see nothing. Right. So it's like, people don't really know what it is. Um, there is such a wide variety of symptoms, you know, depression, anxiety being some of them, um, things like, you know, so, so those are like the ones that we can sort of explain away, right. Or some of the gastro stuff we can sort of explain away, uh, achiness, fatigue, we can explain some of those away, but then what happens is that people get to like the scarier symptoms and then it becomes harder to explain away. So that's like the, you know, uh, rectal dysfunction. And those are like the night sweats and the waking up in the middle of the night, kind of like, you know, heart beating and kind of like sweating all through, you know, your sweat, your bed out kind of thing. And it makes people nervous. And those are the things that usually compel people to try to seek help. But you can get pretty far not knowing what's wrong with you. And again, people have probably heard me say this before too, which is that overtraining syndrome, it doesn't feel like, gee, I think I'm doing too much exercise. It's like, I might have cancer. Like I must have, so I must be dying. Like I don't, my, my, I don't know, something's happening to my body. I don't know what it is, but I'm dying. Like I must be dying because this is not right. Because eventually you'll get to a point where someone who's used to running like, you know, oh, I don't know. Like I always like to pull from my own history of stupidity to help people figure out what not to do, you know, train for whatever race and do, you know, back to back marathons on a weekend because, and don't do that just once, by the way, do that like a few times just before a race, because why not? Um, right. You know, that kind of thing. And you can, you can, someone who's used to doing that all of a sudden is, you know, can't run six miles or can't run 10 miles or whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah. And their whole body is like swollen up like a balloon and they don't know what's wrong with themselves, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And you've done that to yourself. It's, it's actually like, there's nothing wrong with your body in that it's reacting properly. Correct. To the dose that you are prescribing. Correct. That's my, that's my thing. People hate when I say that, but that is the truth. Um, when you have symptoms, particularly, you know, um, because again, you've destroyed your endocrine system and your endocrine system right. is not screwed up. It is doing its right. job, which is to compensate for your bad behavior. It's <laughs> for your bad choices. That's what's happening there. And, um, so people will go in and say, oh my gosh, I lost my period or, oh my gosh, like I, you know, don't, can't get an erection anymore. Or, oh my gosh. I, you know, I, I feel like I want to lay on the bed all the time and, you know, I don't know what to do and all these different things. And it's like, your body's not failing you. And, you know, you've, you've, you've made some choices here that your body's not happy with, but it is trying to deal with what you've thrown at it. And it's doing a great job by the way, because you're still like kind of trucking along, but, um, at some point, you know, you've got to pay the piper. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, we come back to like, you know, the trend is to do more longer, you know, back to back this and that. But I do love when elite professional athletes actually will choose the shorter course. You know, I see that at some of the, especially in the gravel, you know, we have the 200 mile events, the 350, the this and that, but yet you'll see occasional professionals being paid to race their bikes and they'll choose the, the hundred miler that takes them four and a half hours, you know, and I think it brings, it's somewhat of the prestige factor. People are chasing the prestige, you know, fear of missing out. But yet if they see somebody they look up to actually choosing a shorter course, it's like, well, what's wrong with short and fast? I 100% agree with you. And I think that the people who are, you know, I, I hesitate because I always don't know, like, should I be calling them elite athletes or should I be calling them influencers? Because at this right. point they're kind of one of each, right? A little bit of both. Yeah. Um, they have such uh, a great opportunity to help change the narrative here. Um, from my own past, I had a very similar experience with a super duper ultra runner who's like uh, an unbelievable person. And I'm, I'm going to say her name just because she's lovely, which is Chrissy Mail. 
Um, and I was in a group run with her, uh, like around the Stanford campus, like a million years ago. And I asked her something about weekly training mileage. And she was like, yeah, I hover around like 50, 54, whatever it was. And I was like, uh, thinking in my mind that she would be like, yeah, pulling down these like, you know, 90 mile weeks or whatever. And she was like, right. at like a very chill, in my opinion, like 50, 50s. Um, and again, I can't speak for her training now, but at the time that's what she was doing. And I was absolutely bowled over by that. And you would think that I would have stopped and take notice (laughs) and took notice of that. I didn't. I wish I did because she is someone who's been in this sport forever. She's been in ultra marathon forever. And, um, as far as I know is still kind of out there having fun and doing adventures and has never blown up from what I, from what I know, which again, I I've only met her a couple of times, so I'm not really sure, but from what I can gather, she hasn't had that kind of like huge crash that we've seen other people have. And so I would just say that aspect of being judicious about your training cannot be overlooked in terms of its importance. And again, um, you know, the influencer athletes, the elite athletes, the professionals that do, um, you know, maybe they don't turn their Strava on the day that they do less, or maybe they, you know, hesitate to jump into a B race. Like who does a B race anymore? Nobody. Everyone's like, it's A or you don't even put it up on the board, right? So people who are willing to share um, their experiences of a B race or a C race, or um, people who are willing to talk about their taper or their time off or you know, their rest day where it's not an active rest day, by the way, I don't believe in active yeah. rest days, you know, um, they have a real great opportunity to help change the narrative and talk about, hey, it's okay to take time off. In fact, you should. In fact, um, don't we love the sport so much that we don't want to, you know, destroy our, ourselves on it. And and you made a good point. You're like, well, you know, people are using this as, as therapy and they're using it in a way that is incorrect because, Although sport is a great adjunct to therapy, it is not therapy. Um, and it, it can be a tool in the toolbox, but right. it cannot be the only thing. It's just too much of a burden for it to carry. Right. I mean, that comes down to your self-identification. Can you envision yourself not being an athlete? Like, what are you other than the athlete? Well, you know, can you envision yourself being an athlete also, you know, can you envision yourself no. being some percentage an athlete and some percentage 8 million other things? I mean... I feel yeah. very sad that there was a time in my life where I thought that being an endurance athlete was the best thing about me. Like that's depressing to think of now. And back then I was like all about it. Like that was the great, I thought that was the, the greatest thing about me. But what I know now is that I was afraid that there wasn't anything better about me. And that I yeah. used that as kind of a mask because I was afraid to see what else there was. And so um, I think that if anyone's you know, walking around thinking that it's the best thing about you. It's a wonderful thing about you. There's no question, but it is not the best thing about you because I guarantee you that if running fell away tomorrow, people would still love you. You'd still be a great, you know, mother, father, sister, daughter, friend, you know, pet owner, whatever it is, people would still love you and you would still have love to give and life would still go on and, and, and you would make it, you really would. And this is part of you, but it's not everything. Yeah, it's a really good point about the social media influencers, you know, getting this out into, um, you know, their, everyone that they influence, at least bringing this up, um, if they feel they can share those thoughts, you know, openly. Certainly, you know, we see like Michael Phelps has opened up about his mental, you know, issues that he's, he's dealt with and other, you know, big time athletes. So, you know, that'd be great. It's a great opportunity for our athletes to open up about that. Have you seen any national governing bodies or organizations kind of take this on in any respect? Because we have, we certainly have a lot of coaches, you know, listening, um, you know, how, how can coaches get exposed to this and learn more about it? Um, you know, it feels like something needs to be done at, at like an organization level. Have you seen any organizations actually have, you know, educational units based around it or courses, for example. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question. I actually just wrote a paper. It was just published in the uh, journal Sports. I know it's a very creative name for a journal, but um, it was actually on the cover of March. Um, and you can't miss it because there's Cody Beals, who's a triathlete, a pro triathlete, who's okay. running through the finish line. And it's the cover article. And it is talking about um, the prevalence or the discussion of mental illness and ultra endurance sport per ICD-11 classification. And remember that ICD-11, that's the you know, the European version of the DSM-5. And in that article, we talk about the, the need for more um, 
for more governing bodies to get behind the idea that something is going on here and that if we are looking to keep our athletes um, doing what they love and we are looking for the athletes to continue to be participants in the sports, right? I think that's what we all want. Um, and let's be clear, by the way, that is for a health issue. That's for a community issue. That's also for financial issue. There's a lot of invested parties. If we want people to be around for a long period of time, we have to start mm -hmm. a lot, making sure that they understand that their relationship with sport is more like a crystal glass than it is a baseball bat. Right. So like we have to take care of this thing. We have to treat it carefully. We have to be gentle with it. We have to realize that we can't throw it around. It can't just be, you know, all purpose and we can, you know, bat everything away with it. That's not how it works. And so um, there is definitely an opportunity for governing bodies all across the different disciplines to get involved and to start talking about um, really digging into mental health. And by the way, I want to make a distinction here. Um, sports psychology is not what we're talking about here. Okay. So we're not talking about how to get people to the finish line. We're not talking about how to get people to the start line. We're not talking about how to teach people mental focus or how to, you know, drown out distraction. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we're talking about my field, which is sports psychiatry. And that is very different. And so what we're saying is like, think about the Statue of Liberty, right? Give us whatever you got. If you come to us with depression, anxiety, you have an eating disorder, you have, um, you know, OCD, or you might be neurodivergent or whatever it is, come to us. This is a place for you, but we're going to care for everybody who comes to us. We're not going to mm -hmm. just be like, let's throw everyone down, you know, the same, <laughs> the same slide and say, yeah, just figure it out. That's not how it works. We need to be understanding that um, people are going to come into this sport with a, with a, you know, a potential risk for mental disorder. They might go through the sports with a potential risk for mental disorder. We need to start talking to people about how they're managing their lives, not how they're managing their race. Okay. Cause that's something else. Right. That's what you all do. The coaches, right. But how they're managing their lives so that they can be an athlete, but also have a great, wonderful and fulfilling life. That's really right. important. Right. Wow. It's a, that's, that, I mean, I, I definitely have looked forward to this conversation just because of getting this out into the broader, you know, uh, community of, of athletes, endurance athletes. Um, certainly people can follow you on Instagram. I know, and you have, I saw a consultation sign up. I mean, you speak to athletes and coaches, it I looks do. like. Yeah, I do. So I, I talk to athletes, coaches, teams, like all, you know, all different flavors of, 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 uh, people in the sporting community, um, and all over the world, I have to say it's, it's so cool getting to talk to people from, from everywhere. So what I do is, um, you know, I just basically do kind of like a bit of a mentoring session, you know, where we can talk about some of the things that you might be doing that are, uh, not, uh, you know, not helpful and certainly not going to lead to you having a long-term relationship with sport. Um, some people are already quite ill and need some guidance about how to get out of that situation. Um, I do a lot of question answering. I do a lot of, uh, debunking of myths and we have a really good conversation where we do some practical kind of solutions. We talk about the philosophy behind a lot of this stuff. Um, again, so my, you know, my work is in sports psychiatry. So we talk a lot about like, how did we get here? Right? So, if we're not willing to kind of look deep and figure out how not to get down this rabbit hole again, you know, that's, that's going to be part of this, but, but everyone certainly needs practical solutions because believe it or not, there's things that we do from the second you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night that you can do that will support or destroy <laughs> your body and your endocrine system and your relationship with your sport. So there's things you can do all day long to mitigate the damage if you, um, you know, and that's what we talk about. We talk about all those different, um, by the way, this is not hacky stuff. I don't do, there's no hack here. Like there's yeah. no taking adaptogens and, you know, fasting. That's not what we do here. So yeah, we right. do the, the basics of rest and nutrition and, and, um, deep thought and philosophy and back to basics, like, um, coaching um using those coaching precepts that we know of like periodization and cycling and you know macro meso and, and you know cycles and all that stuff and making sure we're taking days it. off and um i really think the coaches can be heroes here but again that's on the coaches not every coach is willing to um willing to to take that risk to tell an athlete to do less and i know you're getting paid to to, to you know make the athlete happy but 
um, being, being willing to take that high road goes a long way toward also changing the culture from a grassroots perspective, but also, you know, keeping your athlete healthy longer, you know, and that's what we're here yeah. for. No, absolutely. I love that. I love that sound advice back to the basics. My father's always said, do the least amount of the most specific at the right time, you know, and yeah, yeah. there's, there's that's right. And your There's dad this- and, and his brethren are the people who kind of, you know, started off this, the, the way of talking about how to train for things, you know, and it's the idea that became, it didn't become out of fashion because it's not still true. It kind of fell out of fashion because it's inconvenient to some of our other goals, like the prestige that you talked about or the aesthetic goals that we have, right? Like we can go down that rabbit hole at some point too. We can talk about people who want to look like an endurance athlete, you know, and performance is going to suffer because of that. So, um, you know, deciding that something doesn't work for us is very different than it actually not working for us. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I encourage everybody to, to, uh, at least follow you on Instagram. You have great posts, great sound advice. Thank you so much for, for everything. And, um, let's, let's have this chat again. And, uh, down the road as more research comes out so we can can continue the conversation. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the training peaks coach cast. Visit trainingpeaks.com for more training and coaching resources.